Hey everybody, Ed Braun, Ella Forge. I appreciate the candor everybody lent me when I put out that last video, but this time around I'm going to be legit with you. The whole point of the last video was of course the fact that there are hundreds of recipes out there where people mix up God knows what to try to get them on, but the truth is any refractory that starts to glaze around AC1 for most carbon steels will actually work, whether you want to try using ground up kitty litter, pottery slip, Rutlands, Satanite, whatever you want. As long as it gets to that point where it will glaze and hold on through its critical temp, it will work. For today's video, however, I will go ahead and show you how I clay a blade. It's not a very lengthy process, but first and foremost, let's go ahead and get some ground rules set up. First and foremost, it's Haman, not Haman, not Hyman. Haman are, of course, how the Japanese, and actually the Chinese before them, differentially hardened blades, not for spring temper, but for the sake of trying to avoid cracking blades when you're working with, of course, homebrewed steels. Today's modern steels don't have that kind of problem, and so the aesthetic qualities of the Haman that are produced on katana are still the traditional aspects that we see with today's Hamans here in America, Europe, and so on. For what it counts, We'll be working with Rutlands again. This is very simple. I'm going to mix it up, I'll put some on a blade, and I'll walk you through this. I already have a blade clayed up. This is for a small collaboration that I'm doing with Keith Howell of Howell Cutlery. And so I'll ultimately show you how I'm going through the process of figuring out what I want to do with a come on and how I want it to show up in the end. All right. First things first, you'll note that when you get your Rutlands from Home Depot, Ace Hardware, or wherever, it's kind of runny and a little bit like, oh, say, bad curds or sour cream. So we have to mix it up. I have a piece of 3 16 inch drill rod that I have bent around and sort of a dough hook to start mixing it up. This way I can guarantee myself not only an even consistency, but the right consistency as well. So, to mount things up, Alright, now I want to get my mixture somewhere between pancake batter and toothpaste. Mixing up the bottom where I know it's a little bit thicker so that I get an even consistency no matter what. And it's not so much for the benefit of playing up the blade this time around as making sure that the next blade that I clay up also gets a solid mix. have it. Alright, so now I'm actually going to go ahead and clay a blade. This is a W1 SAX sent to me by Matt Parkinson back in February to actually clay up, but Matt left a ton of scratches in it. So, in order to make sure that Mr. Forged and Fire Winner's blade does not crack in friggin' quench or go all woogity, I'm going to have to go ahead and sand it all out to 120 grit, which I've already done. Now, before I go throwing on clay on here, I want to make sure that I have any oils and anything else that may interrupt the clay's bond. Get it off the blade and make sure that it's pretty squeaky clean. So, since I want an awesome Haman, I'm going to use some awesome degreaser and just give it a quick spritz. Wipe. And we're good to go. Now, I'll just simply slip it in here and start laying out my lineups. Because this blade already has a decent set of bevels and a distal taper, I have to be very careful with exactly how I'm going to lay out my clay because we don't want it too close to the edge. As it stands, this is not a very wide blade, and I'm going to have to maintain my heat zones pretty damn evenly to make sure that I don't cross that danger zone and ultimately end up driving it too close to the edge or off the edge altogether. To start, I'm just going to leave it here and then make note of exactly how far I'm actually going to go. So I don't end up getting any kind of residual, I'm actually going to make a little quick series of dashes here on the spine so that I can take 
into due consideration where the ashi are per side. Spacing them out not only accordingly, but a little bit further as I get closer to the tip so that none of my heat zones end up crossing over into each other and blurring. To start, you notice that I've got, of course, just two simple implements. And they're nothing fancy, just a piece of music wire and a broken little piece of saw blade. To lay out my ashi, I know that most times when we see videos on YouTube or anywhere else, usually people lay on a spine and then go ahead and drive it down. Mixing in a wash coat. as they go. You'll note that I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to skip that as a wash coat was traditionally used simply for reducing the amount of decarb on the actual blade. Now it's just simply a matter of flip, and you can see that the marks on the spine will allow me to pretty much keep it dead even. For the sake of brevity, I'm just going to pick up this pace a little bit. Now that the ashi have been laid out, I'll go ahead and I'll start laying on a little bit of clay up towards the top of the spine just for making sure that I have good solid heat zone. Going a little bit more random now so that I have something that should hopefully act as a heat sink for the rest of the blade. Notice because I'm getting closer to that main drop in the belly, then I'm also going to go ahead and keep my lines accordingly. Now the ashi on this side are actually a little bit lower than I want, so what I'll do is I'll wait until it dries a little bit and then use a toothpick or popsicle stick to clear off some of that excess length. It's one of the other advantages you have to using this stuff because you can always let it dry, scrape, and then rock and roll. And again, leaving plenty of meat between the clay on the spine and the drop towards edge. One thing to pay close attention to is I'm trying to keep my clay layers fairly consistent. A little bit thicker up towards the spine and then tapering with the ashi. Not particularly happy with this section, so I'm just going to come in now with our magic toothpick and add some of that reticulation that I desire. And of course, if I find any voids or zones that just don't suit me well, I can always come back later on and add a little bit here and there. Alright, I'm also going to put a little quick dash of clay just along the spine to insulate. 
Again, paying close attention. Trying to keep as even in consistency and thickness as possible. And just for a little bit of giggles. Now that this has had a chance to dry a little bit, I can also now come back and clean that off. All right, and there we have it. It's all clayed up. All I have to do now is let it dry a couple of days and I'll be good to go. Now, you don't really have to. I know plenty of guys who will take it straight from claying up right into a forge or oven. Even if it puffs up a little bit, it doesn't hurt it. It's all about what you personally want to do. The best thing you can do with this is not repeat my process, but go ahead and just try experimenting it. This is only after doing this for so many years already. I've worked out my style. Now it's time for you to go and do yours. I hope this video has helped. If it hasn't and you want more further instruction, I would seriously suggest looking up videos by guys like Walter Sorrells or Howard Clark because they're the real guys in this and who really inspired me to pursue this path. I'd like to thank guys like Sean Shepard and Kevin Cashin for being the wonderful guys that they are and friends like Keith Howell, Matt Parkinson, Josh Dabney, and Matt Burkhouse for everything that they've done to help push me further down the path. Thank you very much. 